This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The aging process and the brain. Dr. Rodney Gutman on this edition of Conversations. Dr. Rodney Gutman is the director of the Center on Aging at the University of West Florida, where he is also a professor at the School of Psychology and Behavioral Science. Dr. Gutman focuses much of his study and research on Alzheimer's disease and other age-related issues. He, along with other researchers, is currently working to develop drugs to combat neuropathic pain. Dr. Gutman received his undergraduate degree in chemistry from Florida State University and his Ph.D. in pharmacology from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Prior to joining the University of West Florida, Dr. Gutman was a faculty member at the University of Kentucky. We welcome Dr. Rodney Gutman to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Jeff. Thanks. It's great to be here. You specialize in Alzheimer's disease. Give me sort of the layman's definition of that disease. Al Alzheimer's disease is one of a variety of types of dementias that is related primarily to memory and reasoning. Those are the two critical areas for Alzheimer's disease. So for people who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, it's primarily they have problems with memory and, and rational reasoning, the thought process, understanding how to do certain things maybe that they used to could do years ago. Okay. So one of the earlier signs is exactly that, that perhaps they were a mechanic years ago and suddenly in a new cars inside and out, they could recognize a 67 Ford from a 68 Chevy. Now suddenly they're walking around and they can't recognize those vehicles anymore. And that's something that would alert you that there's something more wrong here than the normal aging process of, okay. because people forget, it's normal. People come to me and ask, what's normal? Well, it's normal. You leave the grocery store and you can't, did I park over here or over there? Or that sort of, that's normal. Right. It's not remembering maybe what the keys are for. That's, okay. That should set off some alarm bells. So, so it's not so much the, the memories, you say, but it's the rationalization. That's when you should be concerned. That's part of it. That's a, that's a significant part of it. It's memory that really affects your ability to function. That's, that's the way to differentiate it. So if you can't remember where your car is parked, that's important, but it's not critical to your life. It's when you can't remember how to bathe yourself. You can't remember uh, how to use the phone book. You, those types of things that are, that are more serious, that are interfering with your daily life. That's when you get really concerned. What got you interested in it, in Alzheimer's? That's an interesting story. It's, you know, you have those people that sort of, that's their lifelong dream, and there are others who fall into it. And I'm one of those that kind of fell into it. Uh, I was interested in chemistry when I, was a, when I was young. I was always fascinated by that. In fact, I was just showing my kids the other day about, you can put, teaching about surface tension. You know, you put pepper in the sink, and then you take soap, and then suddenly the the pepper spreads out to the side. I thought that was just the coolest thing when I was little. And so from, it just blossomed from there. I became interested in it. And as a result of that, I thought, well, maybe I want to go into medicine. I really want to help people. And my cousin is a pediatrician, and I was following in her footsteps. But as time went on, uh, I hit histology. And histology was one of those courses where you do a lot of looking under the microscope and memorizing what you see. And that was the course that kind of did it for me. I realized maybe I don't want to go pure medicine. I really love chemistry and sort of understanding how things work. I'm a, I sort of think of myself as a puzzle solver. I really like puzzles. And as I went along, I decided, okay, what can I do with chemistry and medicine? And doing some research, and I thought, well, pharmacology would be a great way to go. So I applied to graduate school, got in at UAB, um, began the process, I actually started out doing cancer research. But as I looked around, and one of my professors taught neuropharmacology, and it was just fascinating to me about the brain, and I thought, what a puzzle that is. Mm. And as time went on, and there was an opening in her lab, I wanted her to be my mentor, and so I joined her lab and started working on Alzheimer's disease as a graduate student. So I really fell into it, but it was more my love of chemistry and medicine and puzzles that drew me into Alzheimer's disease and has kept me there for 20 years. Where do we stand today as far as finding some sort of, and I almost hate to use the word cure because from what I read, we're a long ways away from that, but some sort of solution for this. Right, um, a cure is certainly possible. Um, we are at the stage now where we're looking more at prevention than a cure. There are still some drugs out there in this latest generation, based on our latest understanding of what Alzheimer's disease is, what's going on in our brain. But 
the uh, issue now is looking at how we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. And we are making progress in that regard. Uh, we understand a lot about the pathology. We um, have a little bit of a time course. In fact, now we think that Alzheimer's disease probably begins in our 40s, maybe even earlier in some cases, at least the, the pathologies that we know that contribute to the disease later in life. And so our current understanding has been a focus on the pathology and how to remove that pathology. And the general logic is if we can delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by just a few years, we can save a lot of money and a lot of heartache. You said it may start in your 40s. Now, is that something that you would, do you mean it just starts internally in your brain or is it something that you could note, that, that I would notice or, right. or, or a person would notice? Great, yeah, there is, there's a differentiation between the pathology and the cognition. We have focused a large part on the pathology, and that is what are the changes in our brain that are occurring. Then, then that's under the microscope. So you know people, well, you can't figure out if someone has Alzheimer's disease until they die. Well, that's only because that was the way it was defined back in 1906, 1907. What we're really concerned about is the clinical part, is what is happening to you in, in the real world and how, do you, how are you functioning. And um, that's where it gets to be difficult, that we know there are pathological changes that are, we can measure in your 40s, but we can't give you a test and determine whether or not there's anything that's any different about you. So your memory, um, we, normally what happens is we compare you, look at your years of education, how old are you, and compare you to the population. It can be very hard to tell on an individual level whether or not you have a cognitive problem or not. Um, so we can detect the changes in your 40s, but there's no way to know for sure that you're going to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease cognitively. I understand. With most diseases, early detection is key. Is that the case with this disease? We believe so. So when you look at uh, osteoporosis, so bones getting brittle, we, we obviously you want to know are your bones getting brittle when you're in your 30s and your 40s to prevent a fall or prevent the, the fractures right, that right. go with a fall. The same is true with Alzheimer's disease. If we can figure out earlier on, perhaps there are some strategies we can t use to delay or prevent Alzheimer's disease in you. So yes, it follows the same trajectory as something like even cancer or bone disease. What are those solutions? For, for pre preventing, preventing or slowing it down? Well, it's, uh, what I tell people is uh, there's a couple standard ones. Eat right, exercise. I would throw in also uh, maintain your blood glucose. Diabetes is an important risk factor. That's come, in fact, we think of Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes. Really? Um, but the other one is choose your parents well. Genes play an important role in your risk for developing dementia, in particular Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Now, we were talking, and you said there's a difference between genetic risk and genetic cause. Explain. Right. So there, are, there have been some genes identified that are causes of Alzheimer's disease. And by that, I mean if you have the mutation, you will get the disease. Okay. There's a few of those. And, and as I understand it, th th that's about, a, what, 5%? 5 5 get... to 10% of the population who get Alzheimer's disease have a genetic cause. It's very rare. Most okay. people who have Alzheimer's disease obviously do not have a genetic cause. Okay. What there is, though, is genetic risk. Okay. And by far and away, the largest gene that plays a role in genetic risk is a gene called APOE. And APOE4 is the flavor, if you will. Um, if you have APOE4, you're at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to having APOE2 or APOE3, for example. Now, we think of that 95% of the population that have sporadic Alzheimer's disease, meaning just for unknown reason. Okay. We think about half of that population has a genetic risk, and APOE being the major one in that, po in that, in that grouping. But somehow you have to trigger that, is that correct? Is it an environmental factor that would trigger that? Or? It's interesting. We, there is a hypothesis called the, the two-hit hypothesis, and that is you have a genetic risk, and perhaps coupled with some type of environmental trigger may result in an Alzheimer's disease or a cancer or some other things. It, it's actually taken from the cancer literature that there is this two-hit or multiple-hit hypothesis. We don't know. There's a huge amount of emphasis on genetic typing for people to look at. Um, people who have clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, it is possible to diagnose Alzheimer's disease clinically. Um, the better your institution, the more focus your, your health professional has in Alzheimer's disease, the more accurate the diagnosis is. About one in five people have an inaccurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, which is important. Um, 
But by getting that diagnosis early, we hope that we can do something to prevent it. Okay. And are there drugs on the market right now that help prevent it? There are no drugs for prevention. We do have um, some drugs that were, came from the 60s and 70s and some more recent developments um, that are the first line of defense, so to speak, for treating Alzheimer's disease. And pretty much people who go in who get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease will be put on that regimen. Um, they're the Aricepts and the Mendas. These are uh, drugs that target areas of the brain, neurotransmitters in the brain more specifically, that we have good evidence to suggest that they are involved in the neurodegenerative process associated with Alzheimer's disease. They don't do anything about slowing the progression. Okay. Um, they are not what were known as disease-modifying drugs. Um, they treat the symptoms, um, improve cognition in some people, um, and people do get some benefit out of, out of those, that regimen of drugs. Okay. But we're waiting for the next generation that hopefully will do more about the disease modification. And, and where are we in that research process? Yeah, when I was a graduate student was really when the first generation of these types of drugs came out. There, there are two main pathologies with Alzheimer's disease that are plaques and tangles. The plaques have been the major focus for the last 20 years or so, particularly because the genes that cause Alzheimer's disease drive that plaque pathology. So of course it makes sense, that's where we would look. Um, with that said, the, the current generation, um, probably about three or four generations in now, have, are much better, um, do clear plaques, but we're still waiting to find out whether or not they have that cognitive benefit that we're hoping for. We hear a lot about stem cell. Is that something that the, in the future that will make it's a difference? Po it's possible. The, the thing about stem cells is we're still a ways away from, from stem cells as, as being good therapy for something like Alzheimer's disease. The problem is maybe a, a, a disease like Parkinson's disease where it's a little more focused, stem cells probably come earlier because there's fewer cell types you have to replicate. With Alzheimer's disease, it's fairly broad. Um, the hippocampus, the frontal cortex, some of those areas of the brain that are involved in cognition and memory are very complicated. And to take stem cells and convert them into those cells and make the thousands of connections that are needed is tricky business. Um, it's certainly uh, one I'm hopeful for in, in the future as the research gets further along and basically understanding how do we make a stem cell behave and do what we want it to do? When that time comes, I think that will be something that we could look forward to. In the short and intermediate term, what are you most optimistic about? I am optimistic about prevention. I think that the education that goes on, there are many people who uh, would benefit from more social interaction, um, from more education, um, f from the types of things we do see about, we know people are working crossword puzzles and the Sudoku puzzles and all those things. Those things are, are probably going to benefit to a certain extent. What I tell people about the crossword puzzles, it's like going to the gym. We know about exercise, we think of the brain as a muscle. You use it or lose it, that's absolutely true. But crossword puzzles and those things are like exercising your biceps. Your brain is not like a single muscle, think of it as your whole body. So when you go to the gym and you want to get stronger and have more endurance, you have to do your legs and your back and your arms and all those sorts of things. Crossword puzzles are like bicep curls. You need to engage with other people, carry on conversations, be thoughtful, continue on as much of a normal life as you can so that you're exercising your whole brain. And there is some decent evidence that that will, that will yield some benefit. What should a person in their 40s and 50s and 60s who seems on the surface to be in great shape, what should they be doing? They really need to make sure they watch their diet, watch their weight, m maintain their glucose levels. Be sure, you know, type two diabetes is a, is a significant health problem. Obesity is a health right. problem. We know already these are contributing, serious contributing factors to dementia and Alzheimer's disease is one form of dementia that what I would throw into that mix. So for I tell people that are uh, diabetic, make sure you, you monitor that well, maintain your blood glucose levels. Your brain uses a lot of energy, a lot of glucose and a lot of oxygen. And that's why people who with diabetes can have some cognitive issues later in life because you need to have very tightly monitored blood glucose in order for you to function well. And anyone who has diabetic knows if their blood sugar is too high or too low, they feel it. And that's not, that's not healthy for your brain. I would also mention, particularly in our area because of the military, we know a lot about the uh, IEDs and the war that's going on, that brain injury 
uh, mild, moderate, and severe forms of brain injury are also significant risk factors for dementia. So there's a lot of research going on into uh, people who've been in the military, uh, athletes, yeah. uh, football players, even girls that play soccer. Yeah. There's some data out there on that about those head injuries contributing uh, meaningfully to dementia later in life. Well, I was going to ask you about that because obviously there's a huge class action lawsuit against the National Football League because of all these players experiencing dementia and all sorts of issues. Uh, where do you stand on that? I'm concerned. Uh, I'm a huge football fan. Don't get me wrong. I love college football and I love pro football. Um, but it is something that we do need to take account for and be cautious of. Uh, for my own children, I will do my best to sort of inhibit them from going into playing those, those types of sports because that's the way the data is today. That's right. not to say that down the road that may change. Right. I understand that. We do get excited about our research. You know, we go through those cycles of coffee's bad for you, no coffee's good for you. The same thing may be true here, but from my research and my knowledge of the research that every type of injury you take on to your brain is basically sensitizing you. You know, if you ever get an injury, mm -hmm. you know, you hurt your back or your knee, it's always sensitive from now on and you're always cautious about it. So the same thing is true for your brain. So when you have, you're knocked unconscious, that adds a certain level of risk. Now it's small risk. Uh, you know, one injury is uh, not too concerned about something like that, but those repeated injuries over and over again are certainly something to be cautious about. And obviously that's what these NFL players are experiencing. And from some of the stuff that I have read, what the neurologists are really concerned about is the cumulative effect from these young men playing football from, you know, high school through college and having that repeated head injury. Absolutely right. I mean, your brain is still developing. I mean, you think about young kids playing football, their brain is still at a high level of development, still what we call plastic, abil uh, the ability to change and form. And those are critical years of development. I mean, of course, the most critical are in the womb and shortly after birth. But um, young kids, I, I mean, that's just me, but I I'm very cautious about that. And, you know, you wear your helmet when you ride a bike, you take, right. when you're riding a motorcycle, I mean, these are this is solid research that would suggest that you know, protecting yourself from brain injury is going to do you good in the long run. Yeah, and, and, and I know there's been some concern about young ladies playing soccer and headbutting and things of that. Is that true as well? There is some papers out there that I've read that, do, would, that would suggest that, and it makes intuitive sense that those types of you know, sudden deceleration, whatever the cause is, your brain is like jello inside. Of, you think of your brain as being hard because it's inside your skull. Well, your skull is nice and hard, but inside is very soft and tender is the way I, I view it. And that sort of sudden slamming of your tender, gelatin-like brain into your hard skull is, is not good. And you can see it in the laboratory, experiments on animals and mice and rats, moderate injuries, mild injuries, are you can detect those changes years later. So do everything you can to protect yourself. It's, Taking care of your body is it's, what you're saying. It's what your mother and grandmother told you when you were little. Yeah. Exactly. One of the things, too, that I've heard some discussion about is exposure to chemicals. And, and, and now tell me if I'm getting off here on, on something because I don't want to open up a can of worms that may not be scientifically sound here. But, you know, I've heard people talk about fillings in your teeth and all this sort of stuff. Is that legitimate? Nothing to be concerned about. Um, in fact, uh, the director of the center in Kentucky. Um, was one of the ones who did a lot about to solve some of these myths. So okay. aluminum in the water and mercury in your fillings. Um, and he did a lot of work to debunk those myths. So um, there certainly heavy metals, those types of things, so aluminum and, and mercury and, and those things are not good for your brain. Right. But you have to be exposed to pretty high levels for a considerable length of time before they would have any measurable impact on you. So, uh, for example, his research looked at people who, uh, um, who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and then counted the amount of fillings that they had, measured the amount of mercury in their blood and in their brain, and was not able to find any correlation between the levels in their brain or the number of fillings they had and Alzheimer's disease. But let's say you were working around that for an extended period of time and handling it and stuff like that, th then that's a different that's story. That's a different story. Uh, people who work in aluminum factories or work in situations where they're exposed to those types of chemicals, um, they should be wearing the proper protection so that they're not exposed. Even in my own laboratory, um, we work with chemicals like that and we take precautions to make sure we're not exposed to high levels of those. Okay, but I shouldn't necessarily be worried about household chemicals if I'm going to, you know, clean the shower or something. That's right. The, 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 um, as a pharmacologist, that's part of my training is about drug-drug interaction, those sorts of things. And what, you, what we learn in pharmacology is that concentration matters. 
the amount matters. So just like you need a certain amount of vitamin E or a certain amount of uh, manganese in order to be healthy, too little is bad for you and too much is also bad for you. But it, you have to be somewhere in the, in the normal range. And the amount that you're exposed to in a day-to-day -day amount is generally not significant. Yeah. And I've heard, uh, for example, uh, agricultural chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, and things of that nature. Where, where do we stand with that? For Alzheimer's disease, not so much. But for movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, very significant factor. In fact, we use those chemicals as model, animal models. So when we want to model Parkinson's disease, for example, we might give them a compound like rotenone, for example, which is a part of the process of pesticides. So it's fairly well described that exposure to chemicals can contribute to Parkinson's disease, not so much on Alzheimer's disease. Okay. But going back to that on the, on the chemical issue with Parkinson's, uh -huh. even that, but, but once again, that's not, I need to be worried about a can of bug spray or, or so, you're talking about high levels of concentration on a long-term basis. That's correct. So people in agriculture, so farmers or people who manufacture those chemicals are, are certainly at a higher risk. But because of the knowledge that we have, I mean, those should be minimized because right. they should be wearing protection. Right. And if you're exposed to it once or twice, I mean, that's not, it, it's that 30-year period of time. I would not panic about a, a one-time exposure or a very infrequent exposure to those types of chemicals. My laboratory is we're very careful, but obviously we have a variety of chemicals in there that are toxic and mm -hmm. are labeled as such. But we work with them in small amounts and small doses and take proper precautions. I'm not concerned about it. Interesting. Very, very, very fascinating. Neuropathic pain is something right. you're, you're working to curb. First of all, what is it? Neuropathic pain is a type of pain associated with damage to nerves and that the, the nerve that might be associated with transmitting pain is now damaged, and so it's too frequently or a too strong sending signals to your brain that are signifying this hurts. Uh, you experience a lot of people who have severe injuries or uh, long-term pain might experience something similar to that as well. But that's, in a nutshell, it's basically damage, direct damage to a nerve. And what are you doing to... to try to curb that? Uh, we have developed a series of compounds that, um, working with a colleague at the University of Kentucky, um, we think may have an impact on decreasing the neuropathic pain. So there are models where you can uh, take an animal, damage its nerve, and then measure how much pain is it's experiencing. And we're comparing it to opiates and things like that to see how well it does. And we're very hopeful. Um, the issue with neuropathic pain is many of the drugs are, are very potent and maybe um, result of people being addicted, and we're hoping to avoid some of those issues. Okay. I want to come back around here for a second because it seems to me, I want to talk about diabetes again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting that you, uh, that, that you bring that up. And, uh, you know, obviously in the press there's an awful lot of talk about the epidemic. Are we at epidemic proportions of, of, of type 2 diabetes, of type 2 diabetes I, I, in this country? My colleagues that study it will no doubt tell you yes. Okay. So what we're finding out, what you're telling me is, is not only is it going to affect me from a, you know, from a physical standpoint and some of the issues, circulation, so on and so forth, but it starts to really mess with the brain. That's right. We fully anticipate that uh, with the combination between uh, traumatic brain injury and diabetes, there's, there will be an increase in the number of people who, are, who have some signs of dementia. Well, wow. and then the other argument that I've heard is, it, is people say, well, there seems like there are more cases of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and, and all these other diseases out there than there used to be. Is that because we're better at identifying them? Is it because people are living longer or is it because something else is going on? There are not, there are more people, but there's not a greater proportion of people. Okay. It is exactly as you pointed out. It's because we're living longer and there's more older adults than ever before. Okay. I mean, we've doubled our lifespan since 1900. You know, average lifespan in 1900 was 46 or so. We're almost 80 now. Wow. And so back in 1906, 07, you can imagine when Alzheimer's disease was discovered, you know, hardly anybody had it right. because no one lived that long. Right. Now it's not uncommon. I mean, people who live to be 65, there's lots of things to look forward to about getting older. We know we've talked about Alzheimer's okay. disease, but, you know, it's getting older is better than the alternative, obviously. Right. But people who live to be 65 now can look forward to, on average, another 15 or 16 years. Yeah. So a lot of that longevity we've gotten is basically infant mortality rates have decreased dramatically. And so we see a lot of uh, now people who they're not, they're not dying when they're young, they live to be 65, they might see very well see 85. Right. And so that the number one risk factor of Alzheimer's disease is age. So that's, that's the real reason behind it. And diagnosis is improving. Really research in Alzheimer's disease has only taken off in the last 25 years. 
That's absolutely fascinating. You're the director at the University of West Florida Center on Aging. What do you guys do? Uh, we run the gamut. We have faculty from across disciplines, all three colleges, interested in aging from all its areas. So we, we look at aging. The way I talk about my center is uh, we're not a center on the aged or disease. We're really a center on aging. So we take a, a lifespan approach to aging, that aging begins really from the minute you're born. Right. But realistically, we look at aging post-maturity. So around 18 or 22, 30, depending on what you're looking at. And so our faculty across campus are interested in genetics of Alzheimer's disease, for example, uh, retirement, grandparents taking care of grandchildren, learning and memory, uh, you name it, the different disciplines, there's almost always representation of exercise. We have lots of people at UWF interested in, in Alzheimer's and aging research. And, and speaking of that, I happen to see on your website you're looking for folks to engage in research with you? Yes, we always need people to volunteer. We do a lot of survey-based research, and we're hoping as time goes on, as we get new faculty to do more clinical-based research, um, to, to join in and participate. We need all ages. Anyone 18 and older is welcome to participate. You, you sign up online. Um, and volunteer and then about we do three or four studies a year um, that go out um, it covers again all those different areas I just talked about interesting so in about a minute and a half or so give me a synopsis of what we should do to live a long healthy happy life well as I mentioned choose your parents well <laughs> having good genes is the number number one thing you can do what I tell people and I tell my older adults that I work with is to educate young people about nutrition and exercise. It's very important, especially for women. Um, girls, women live longer than men, and girls have unique health issues they need to take care of. And so, particularly for them, is exercise is very important for their bone density. Um, you know, risk of falls, aside from Alzheimer's disease, right. which is important, um, but cardiovascular disease and, and pulmonary diseases are, are ranked much higher than Alzheimer's disease, in fact. Okay. Um, but eating right, exercising, staying engaged with people, enjoying life, relaxing, having fun is important. Um, when you talk to centenarians, people who are over 100, they tell you, live life. Life. You know, um, uh, my, the theme in the Center on Aging is think, adapt, succeed. I'm a firm believer in being able to adapt. We, that's how we got to be human beings and live for uh, all, these, all these years. That's why the dinosaurs aren't here. They didn't adapt, <laughs> and humans did. And, and, and I would say on top of that, uh, I'm, I'm sure stress reduction plays a big role oh, as well. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that, that one glass of red wine probably doesn't hurt. Okay, that's great. What a fascinating conversation. I, I know I learned an awful lot, and I, I'm well, sure everyone else did too. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Gutman, thank you so very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Our pleasure to have you. By the way, you can keep up with Dr. Gutman and all the many issues related to aging at the Center on Aging website. That web address is www.uwf.edu slash COA. And by the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take good care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.